Good morning. So this is uh, the seventh lecture on computer control, and it is devoted to parametric identification. Let's put these words in perspective. Uh, up to now, uh, we have been discussing the structure of linear models, linear time invariant models for to represent uh, systems, dynamic systems in continuous time, in the discrete time. So we have spoken about the difference equation, about the digital transfer function, which is the quotient of the Z transform of the output divided by the input with zero initial conditions. Uh, we also introduced the, the state space model in discrete time and uh, we know how to convert between these models so if i give you uh, for instance uh, a state space model you are able to write an equivalent difference equation or a digital transfer function and vice versa and uh, also we uh, answer this problem Suppose that we have a continuous linear time invariant system and uh, you connect it to a computer via uh, DA and AD converters. And uh, the question is, what is the digital transfer function seen by the computer? So what is the digital model seen by the computer? And this is what we solved yesterday. Now, this type of, of um, uh, topics assume that you have you, somehow you have a model okay and we were mainly concerned about the structure of the model how, how do we write models in practice what you have is a is a plant and the plant does not have a target uh, saying well my model is and it's something written there Okay, so if you if you look at uh, a robot, now we can buy robots, even in supermarkets, small robots, or uh, a drone, or a washing machine, or anything, a boiler, if you want to speak about industrial equipment, uh, it does not have a, a piece of paper saying, my state space model is blah 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 okay so what you have is to build a model and you have two types of approach to build building models that are complementary one uh, type of approach is uh, relying on physical equations on the physics or the chemistry or the basic uh, principles related to the system but if you have if you are modeling uh, i presented some models about um, computer servers and optimizing the function of computer servers and for that you don't have basic or physical laws uh, so the other approach is to look at data from the system and uh, from the data you somehow infer the model that relates the data these models are approximations in both cases. I mean, suppose that you have a robot uh, and you want to model it. Okay, you, you, you know a lot about mechanics. You believe in uh, Newton's law. Uh, and then you pick up the, the masses that move independently. You related them by forces, springs and uh, other types of forces and you write equations and you think well this is exact uh, an exact model it is not because for instance you are relating very small masses that appear here and there okay uh, so uh, you are neglecting this fast behavior the these elements with fast behavior and this is an approximation now, if you rely on data to build your model, you also have a lot of uncertainty. 
first of all, what is the order of your, your model? You don't know. So you have to estimate it. Some systems have an infinite order. For instance, if you have a flexible bar, the order is infinity. You can think of it as an infinity number of very small particles uh, connected together with elastic uh, connections. And uh, these small particles, actually an infinite number of particles, each one has a state which is position and velocity. So you have uh, an infinite uh, state the, made by the position and velocity of all the small particles that form the flexible bar. Of course, you, you can do an approximation and say, well, I just uh, approximate my, my flexible bar by one damped mass. It's a, a mass point. What, what the, the people from physics say, it's a mass point, okay? Then the, the state is just two variables, position and velocity. Or you can say, now I have uh, one mass point, linked to another smaller mass point okay so i have uh, a main uh, mode oscillating mode and then a faster oscillating mode associated to the smaller okay now it's four and, and go and so on and so on so uh, but you you will never be able to build an exact model for the flexible bar it's an approximation and in many cases, the system is not of infinite order, but it is so complex that you have to do approximations. So uh, we have these two methods based on physical principles and based on plant data. Here, we are going to speak about modeling based on plant data in this chapter. It's, it's the main, one of the main chapters of the course. And the title is Parametric Identification. Let's see what these two words mean. Suppose that you want to recognize someone, okay? So I have pictures of you, and I want to uh, recognize who you are. So I look at uh, my, my library of pictures, and I look at some of you, and I do a comparison and I say, oh, okay, this is Rita. And uh, then uh, I look at another one of you and I say, well, I look at the pictures and I say, well, this is Renato and so on, okay? This is identification. Identification is essentially recognizing uh, the type of person or the type of system in our case. Uh, in, uh, Dynamical systems don't have eyes or nose or mouse or legs or hands, but they have order, for instance. Order is an important, important feature. Think of order as the nose of dynamic systems. Okay? So uh, one thing is to identify a system. That is to say, what is the structure of the system? But then you have another issue, which is, what are the parameters that define the system? I look, for instance, at Rita, and I think, what is the, the height of Rita? Okay, that's a parameter. What is the weight of Rita? Well, this should not be asked to ladies, but anyway, what is the weight of Renato? That's a more uh, correct uh, question to pose, okay? This is an example of parameter estimation. So you look, you look at Renato, and uh, you do some measurements, and you estimate from these measurements, you estimate uh, the parameter weight of Renato. Okay, so you have these two things: identification and um, estimation of parameters. Now, we have here parametric identification. You can uh, look at a system and uh, make no assumptions about its, its structure, apart from being, say, linear. Okay? So you don't rely 
on a predefined equation that you want to fit on the, on, the, on the system or you want the system to fit on this equation. Okay, so you don't have the equation. That's non-parametric identification. Now assume that you say, well, my system is of say second order and this is described by a difference equation. So I don't know the parameters that uh, define the, the second order difference equation, that define the poles, the coefficients that appear in the equation. These are the parameters that enter, okay? So I want to uh, decide what is the problem, what is the system by estimating these parameters for that model, okay? That's parametric identification. That's what we are going to speak about. So parametric identification is to find out a model for a dynamic system. Let's consider the uh, linear dynamic systems. And uh, what we are going uh, to do is to find what type first, what is the order of the system, and then what are the parameters that enter the system, the coefficients in the difference equation, okay? That's the meaning of these two words. Now, what are the methods that you use for this, okay? Uh, the, you, you can think of, of many methods, several methods. The most powerful uh, methods that you can use for parametric identification are based on optimization, okay? So, uh, Engineering, in general, is a matter of optimizing something. So the most powerful methods, the most powerful methods of engineering design, you define uh, a target function and you adjust the arguments of this function to find the optimum, the maximum or the minimum. For instance, the, uh, the minimum, the energy spent by the system or anything else, okay? So you can formulate this parametric identification problem as uh, an optimization problem. And uh, the method is this. Suppose that um, I, I look at some of you and I have uh, the pictures of all of you, okay? So one possibility might be to measure, uh, for instance, uh, the eight of of each of, of the the eight of the person that I'm looking at. I don't know who is. I want to identify him or her, and uh, I measure um, the height, altura, the mass altura, and uh, say the length of the hair. You comprimento the cabelos, and then. I compare these two measurements with the information I have from my database of pictures, okay? And uh, somehow I have, uh, I find the picture that corresponds to the least smallest error, okay? We have to de define what we mean by error because we have two variables, the eight of the person and the length of the air, but we will discuss that. So the idea is to solve, pose the problem as an optimization problem. And uh, we are going to consider uh, essentially two types of uh, opti um, optimization functions, optim optimal functions to solve these problems. Although several others could be considered. And this will lead you to least squares and to maximum likelihood estimators. Another thing is this. Suppose that I want to estimate the parameters of my system. And uh, uh, I can uh, proceed in two ways. One way is to sit with a lot of patience patients do a lot of observations, say 1,000 or 1 million observations. 
And then with this one million observations, I do a lot of computations and I end up with an estimate of the parameters, okay? That's much identification or much estimation, okay? Estimação em lot. Portanto, eu vou, uh, pego nos meus dados todos, tenho um milhão de dados e com base nesses dados faço contas e calculo os parâmetros. Estimação em lot, em inglês, batch. This is not practical for an electrical engineer because in many cases, you would like to, um, when, when you receive more information, another point of information, you would like to update your estimates with this new uh, data point without having to recompute everything. So, uh, we are going to study uh, a method that allow you, allows you to, uh, you have an estimate that was obtained from some data points, and then a new data point appears. And uh, what you do is, instead of recomputing everything with the whole set of data, you just, combine your previous estimate with your new data point, okay? And this reduces memory and it reduces computational time. And uh, you, you, you might say, well, this is quite esoteric. It's not. All of you have, uh, for instance, uh, mobile phones and the, mo the mobile phone would not work without recursive methods because otherwise your memory would be growing when time passes, and this would be impossible. For instance, and the mobile phone has a lot of um, parameter estimators inside algorithms, parameter estimator algorithms inside, okay? So uh, another example is control. Suppose that you want, you, you can design a controller, which is a fixed controller. So I have my plant and I study the plant, I build a model, then I design a controller for that model. But uh, the system can change for a number of reasons, because of uh, wearing, o sistema pode mudar porque se desgasta, or um, the system is not exactly what I was expecting. There is a, a funny example related to the Amazon warehouse where uh, I don't know exactly what is the situation now because everything is quite a secret. But uh, in the first designs bef before, before this system uh, became part of Amazon Robotics, it was a company called Kiva Robot Robots. And they were using very low cost uh, components to build the robots that moved the parts in the warehouse. And uh, so there was a big variability, okay? So uh, what they were doing was to update the model in operation. And when they update the model, they redesign online the controller. So uh, in real time, they are receiving data from the operation of the robot. And they use this data they, they are receiving to update the model, to get better and better models. And when they were updating, after updating um, the model, they were redesigning the controller so that the controller could improve. Okay? And uh, so this is what we call adaptive control. And it's an important uh, application of recursive methods. So, what, what are we going to study in this lecture and the next lectures? We are going to study parametric identification. Okay? That is to say, how can I uh, estimate the parameters of a different situation in our case? And we are going to uh, study uh, first non-recursive methods, and then to modify non-recursive methods to obtain recursive methods. And uh, we will start, we will formulate this problem as a problem of uh, minimization. 
And uh, we are going to start by studying least squares, the least squares criterion, and then the maximum likelihood criterion. Okay, that's what we are going to say. By the way, do you have an idea of when the story of formulating problems as optimization problems for engineering design appear? Does what, anyone know some idea uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150, 200? years ago, 300 years ago, when, when does this appear? Does anyone have an idea? No one? What is your guess? Is, there, is anyone able to guess uh, how long the idea of designing, of formulating design problems and estimating problems based on optimization, optimizing a course, solving a, an optimization problem appeared? In the 50s or something close to it? Don't know. Okay. Uh, it's not so bad. Okay. Actually, uh, the major interest came after the, or during the Second World War, so in the 40s. So you are not missing much. Okay, and it was related to pointing artillery to um, fast planes, fast moving planes. Okay, so uh, aircraft artillery. And um, the idea was uh, when, you, when you shoot a gun to a moving target, you should not point at the pre present position, you should point at the future position because there is a uh, uh, travel time for the shell. Okay, so uh, you have to make a prediction of you. May, you have to make a prediction of the position where the aircraft is going to be. Okay, and you point at that, that, that point. And the first guy who talked about it was uh, Norbert Wiener. You have probably heard about him in connection to cybernetics. And uh, he wrote a, a very complicated uh, report. No one could understand, actually. The, his work at the time was, was not, uh, uh, was understood by uh, only a few people and uh, had very little impact, direct impact on the practical application, but conceptually it was quite important. And we are going to solve this, to see not the Wiener solution, but Another solution to the same problem of prediction, which is a quite important problem in engineering, in control engineering, predicting the things. So it was about, say, um, uh, in the in the in say for, in the forties. Okay, the the report was um, for secrecy for uh, security reasons was was published only in nineteen forty five, but it was say in the forties. But actually. The, this idea of uh, formulating a problem as an optimization problem, and Wiener was formulating the problem of prediction as an optimization problem, uh, actually appeared much before, about uh, 200 years ago, a little bit more. And um, it, was, uh, it was suggested by someone that you, at least you know the name, was Gauss. Carl Gauss, okay? And um, Carl Gauss at the time had more or less your, your age. He was about your age. He was a, a young about 20 in his 20s, okay? And the problem was this. Uh, it was related to um, computing the parameters of a planet. Later, I will tell you more about this story in the end of, of the chapter. But uh, you, you can have the, this idea that he formulated the problem of estimation as a least squares problem. So of finding the small the parameters that minimize a quadratic function of the error. Okay, So Gauss invented least squares. He was not the only one. There was a French mathematician who also invented the same thing independently, more or less at the same time, a little bit after Gauss, but was independently. 
uh, so it was 200 years ago okay um, so you you have these two important marks gauss inventing the square 200 years ago in the beginning of the 19th century and uh, wiener in the second world war inventing the uh, the predictors and formulating predict the prediction problem in terms of uh, uh, the min a minimization problem. Okay. Perhaps we, we would like that you would uh, be, Wiener would be thinking about prediction problems related to some other thing, but uh, that's, that's life. I mean, it happened. Okay. So let's, let's start. Let's start with a very simple problem, okay? And my problem is this. I have, uh, this problem will allow me to introduce uh, the basic elements of esti an estimation problem. So suppose that we have uh, a constant source, a constant battery of, uh, with a constant, um, tension between its terminals, I call it V. And this is related, is, this is um, connected to a resistor, okay? And uh, I apply different tensions and I measure the current, okay? And I want to relate the current with the uh, tension. So uh, the first thing is I have an experimental setup. So estimation always is done in relation to some setup, usually an experimental one. Can be a conceptual one, for instance, the economical systems or managing systems. I mean, you cannot have them in the lab. So you, we have the labor, laboratory setup, okay? And the experiment. And then we do this experiment several times and we get data. You see here the table of data. We have different values of tension in different values of current. Okay, and suppose that I have these are the values. I did. And I want to uh, find the relation between the current and the tension. Okay, so one possibility would be to uh, apply many values of the tension and record the correspondent uh, currents, but that would not be practical because uh, you would need a lot of, uh, you would need uh, a lot of numbers. Uh, you, you would need to write a big book because what happens when the tension is say 1.73 volts or 2.5 or 2.99, okay? So it's not practical just to give the numbers. So we pick up a number of representative data and we have this. And now what we are going to do is to assume a model that relates the tension and the current, okay? And um, the simplest model is a linear one. So I'm going to assume that the current is proportional to the tension applied to the resistor, and I want to estimate this parameter G, okay? So we have the experimental setup that defines the experiment. We have the data by doing experiments on this experimental setup. Now I assume a model that relates the variables. There is an independent variable, in this case V, and then there is a dependent variable I, which is the result of the experiments of applying V. And I'm assuming a model, okay? You can say, but he, he, you are assuming, it's obvious, it's obvious that I equal to the inverse of, of the resistance times V, okay? That's your prejudice. For instance, if you apply uh, 10,000 volts to a, a very small resistor, what you get is just to burn the resistor. So the model is not valid. Or if you start changing 
the tension in a very fast way, then there are other effects, not only the resistance, the resistance effects, but capacitive and even inductive effects, then the model is no, no longer this one, okay? So this model has a range of validity. Okay, so this is something that you should know about. Uh, models are not written on the stars. But it's reasonable, it's reasonable that within some range, and we think that it's a range in which we operate, uh, you have this. Now, the problem is uh, you know I and V and you want to know G, okay? That's the inverse problem. The direct problem would be I know G and V and I want to make a prediction about I. Now, if I plot the data, you see this, the horizontal variable is the tension applied and the vertical one is the current. Uh, the problem is that these uh, points do not lay on a straight line. Okay, this is almost a straight line, but it's not exactly a straight line. In some other cases, due to deviations of the model with respect to reality or to noise, that is to say, measurement errors or disturbances that affect the experiment in that I cannot control, the deviations could be even larger. So what is the straight line that, uh, what is the straight line that uh, explains this data? Uh, before going on, uh, I could have assumed a quadratic uh, relationship. So G1V plus G2V squared plus G0. Why, sh why should I have a zero current uh, for a tension of zero? Okay. Uh, actually, if you have, if you have uh, N points, you, you can uh, have a polynomial that passes exactly by the n points and the polynomial is of order n minus one. So why not use this type of models? You don't want to use this type of models because when you start complicating your model, adding more features to the model, the capacity of the model to explain the data is reduced. If you know that you can pass a polynomial of order, say we have four points, so with a cubic polynomial, we could have passed exactly through these points, okay? But uh, we would not be explaining intermediate values. Actually, we could have uh, very big errors in, in predicting uh, the tension in, um, uh, points where for which we don't have data. There is a there was a, a demo of MATLAB, which was uh, was uh, removed. I think because it could be a little bit controversial, and the idea was uh, you know that in the United States they have uh, population census since. Um, uh, seven uh, seventeen nine nine. Uh, 90. New sets since invent. Okay, so they have 230 uh, years of data uh, every uh, for the population every 10 years. So they have 23 points for the population. Okay, so uh, the demo was okay. Let's fit polynomials uh, to this, and the population is grow growing. It's not a straight line, so a straight line is a very bad model. So you go on trying to use uh, second order polynomial, third order polynomial, and so on. And then you have a polynomial of order 16, or then the same. And what was happening was that the polynomial was passing through all the points, but then after a few years, when you have no longer points, the, the prediction would that the population would go to zero, okay? So the, the country would disappear, according to that. So why is this? Uh, it's, it's related to a mathematical issue. Uh, and the mathematical issue is that the convergence of the models when you don't have points is much slower 
than uh, in the regions between points, okay? So, uh, complicating the model by adding more parameters, it's a kind of illusion. I mean, that's an acceptable point if you have a good reason to think that this is uh, a second order function, you uh, can try and add another, another parameter to see if you have a significant improvement. Otherwise, you should always use the simplest model that gives you a reasonable prediction of the values. Okay? So we use a linear system. And uh, we want to have a compromise of our model, which is a straight line, with the data. Okay? So uh, the idea was to uh, build the sum of the squares of the deviations. Is here written here, the sum of the squares of the deviations. What is this? Suppose that you apply a tension of one. According to your model, uh, you are expecting to have uh, you are expecting to have uh, a current which is g, the parameter you don't know, times one volt. But what you have observed is two point one ampere, okay, or milliampere in this case. So you have a deviation. And this deviation is indexed by g, okay? And you square the deviation because you want to uh, penalize deviations in one direction as much as deviations in uh, the opposite direction for the variations of g. So that's why you have the square, okay? Now, if you have one point, well, if you have one point, the minimum of this function is very easy, is finding g such that g times 1 is equal to 2.1, which is g equal to 2.1. But if you have another point, the, the value of g would be different. So what you do is you penalize, you penalize all these differences for the whole data point. So you build a function of g that penalizes the differences between what you expect the value for the different independent variables considered one, two, three, etc., with respect to the actual observed values. Okay, this is a quadratic function of g. So uh, you you can think of this in this way. Uh, so there is a value that corresponds to the smallest value of this function j of g. Okay in which you have your compromise according to this principle of these squares. Now, if g is too large, then uh, j starts to increase because you are deviating a lot with respect to all of them in one direction. If g is too small, j also increases because you have nev negative deviations, but then you square them. So negative deviations are have the same effect as positive deviations. And you say, my estimate of the true value of g is the minimum of this function, okay? So uh, what you do is, remember, this is a very basic and important thing that you have to understand. I have my model, so I write a function, which is a sum of squares of what? Of uh, the independent variable of the independent variable as predicted by your model in ge for a general value of the parameter that you want to estimate. And you compute the deviation with respect to the actual observation, okay? Now, uh, to find the G that minimizes this, that corresponds to the, to the estimate, what you do, you compute the partial, the derivative of J with respect to G, this is just one, one uh, parameter, and you equate it to zero. So you get, you get this linear equation, and you solve this linear, linear equation, and uh, it's very simple, no? I mean, it's very long because I, I was writing the plus, the multiplication sign, and so on. 
but actually this is very this is nothing more than this linear equation and you solve it and you get the estimate of g okay this is not the true value of g the true value of g is something that in practice you will never be able to know this is your estimate of g according to your criterion of the squares okay any question about this is this example this is quite important if you don't understand it well, tell me and i will try to explain it better cat the cat ate your tongues o gato comeu sua língua okay let's move on so uh, let's see a, a case which is a little bit more general okay so suppose that you have two um, two quantities x and y x you can change and y is something that uh, you observe uh, by applying the quantity x to an experiment that you have okay so your model is assumed to be linear y is equal to alpha x everything is scalar here for any x you are expecting to have a y which is alpha times x and you want to estimate estimate the parameter alpha from a set of observations of x and y so the first thing is to do a lot of experiments and to collect data so you have numerical data so here are symbols but in general uh, what you have these are numbers okay i wrote symbols to be general but these are numbers so possible values of x and the corresponding observations for y okay now what you do you form the least square functional the functional minimum quadrat which is the sum for all points of the difference between what we expect y to be for a given x and uh, the difference of this with respect to the what we actually observe so yi is what we observe when you apply xi alpha xi is what we are expecting to observe given the our belief that the model is correct okay so this becomes a function of alpha okay this quantity is sometimes called the deviation you see if you have uh, some value for alpha if you have some value for alpha you have this deviation okay now the 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 trick is to find the straight line that uh, makes a compromise of all these deviations and you do this compromise by minimizing this quadratic function with respect to alpha. So you compute the derivative of j with respect to alpha, if you weight it to zero, and you get something uh, which is this formula here. Remember that the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. So uh, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives, and the derivative of the square is two yi minus of xi times the derivative of the uh, this term here with respect to alpha which is minus xi okay so now you solve it with respect to alpha hat okay alpha is a, is a constant so when you sum when you sum you get summation of xi y i minus summation of alpha hat xi squared alpha hat is constant so we can place in evidence and you you solve this equation and you get this result okay now what is the reason for this mysterious one off here any anyone has an idea why not just to consider the derivative and when i put the one off am i changing something of the result so that the the two that comes from the derivative uh, goes away yes it's it simplifies the computation do i change yeah. something in the final result no no because uh, i mean 
if I multiply this equation by two, uh, then I get one here and I still have zero here. So the result is not changed. If you want to think about the function, it's like having a function which is, let's see, if I multiply everything by one off, the function gets more open, but the minimum does not change. Okay, so uh, my 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 impulse is to make to to make a, something with my hands, but you cannot probably see it very well. But the idea is that if you multiply by a constant which is not zero, a positive constant, you just scale you you scale this curve, but the position of the minimum gets unchanged. I mean. If you multiply by one half, this point here moves to this point halfway between here and zero, but the horizontal position is unchanged. And we get rid of that story uh, of uh, multiplying everything by two and then dividing by, by two. Okay. Now, uh, the other thing is not all quadratic functions have a minimum. Uh, for instance, we could have a maximum, or we could, could have not, neither a maximum nor a minimum. So, uh, what is the condition that I must check for this optimum to be uh, a minimum? You remember? Second derivative. The second derivative must be positive. That's why. Right. So. In this case, the second derivative is nothing more than the sum of the squares of the independent data. Okay, so if not all the data is zero, then you can uh, you can actually uh, have a good estimate, or at least an estimate that is well posed. Okay, that's reasonable. I mean, if all the points are at zero, in this case, if all the points are at zero, uh, then you have uh, you are defining one straight line by just one point zero zero. Okay, that is not a good thing. But uh, if you at least one of the points is outside zero, then you have at least two points and you have a straight line. Okay, if you have more points, you have this compromise. This type of conditions on the second derivative actually impose that the data must be rich enough. Okay, rich enough. That's quite important. Suppose that you want to estimate the pole of a system. Suppose that you have a, a first order system and you have the position of the pole and you have a static gain. Okay? Now, suppose that you apply only constant values to the input and you start in equilibrium. Then what you can estimate is just the static gain because you are only seeing values in equilibrium. Now, if you disturb your system away from the equilibrium, it starts shaking. When it starts shaking, you can probably estimate also the pole, you see? So there are conditions called persistency of excitation conditions that basically tell you that you should shake your system to, um, uh, you should check your system to get a good model. Otherwise, <clears throat> otherwise the estimates will not be good. Uh, sometimes you need to increase the number of data or you need to increase the amplitude of the data. In the la laboratory, you are going to see that you, you have to uh, extend the duration of the simulation experiments uh, because if you work with uh, relatively small uh, lengths of uh, uh, experimental data, uh, your estimates will be uh, much poorer. Actually, it's, 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 it will be difficult, it will be difficult to get um, a good model. Okay, but the main point is this one, and you should remember this fact right from now, your data must be informative enough. And informative enough means that 
when you are solving these optimization problems for estimation, then you should uh, you you should uh, have data that shake your system, okay? That uh, excite your system enough so that all the parameters can be estimated. Okay. Now, uh, we were using this criteria of least squares, minimizing the square of the, the sum of the squares of the deviations of the model with respect to data. But this is not the only thing. And actually, this criterion can be a very bad one. Now, let me give you a non-politically non correct example, okay, now, nowadays. Suppose that you, you are a hunter. You hunt pigeons, okay? Um, and uh, you apply your uh, least squares criterion to point, to point your shotgun to the pigeons. And now you have uh, two pigeons that come to you. In which direction are you going to, to point uh, your shotgun? You have two pigeons coming to you, and you point your shotgun according to the least squares criterion of the deviation of the direction with respect to the pigeons. What is the direction in which you are pointing the, the shotgun? Can you tell me? No, my that's right in the middle so <laughs> that's an, eco an ecological hunter uh, will use this uh, this uh, this square square theory okay so it's obviously not uh, it's an extreme situation but it tells you that uh, a criterion can be optimal without being good okay there is another joke that says that according to least squares the best clocks the best watches are the ones that are stopped because they tell you the exact time, absolutely exact time, twice a day. Okay? Os bons relógios, os melhores relógios, de acordo com o critério dos mínimos quadrados, são os que estão parados, porque dão horas absolutamente certas duas vezes por dia. Okay, uh, so we can consider other, other um, criteria. And uh, we are going to study another criteria. Uh, which is uh, uh, maximum likelihood, maximum resilience. For instance, in this case of pigeons, we could uh, use as probability, as a criterion, the probability of the position of the pigeons. In, the, in each case, uh, we have a function, which is a probability of, of the pigeons being in some place according to uh, your observations that had two maxima. So you would have to select one of these two maxima to, to point your shotgun. Okay. So uh, criteria, these criteria are not written in the stars. I mean, this is not Newton's law. Even Newton's law is not written in the stars because you have relativity theory. Okay. Uh, and probably you will have other things, other theories. Okay. Theories are approximations and criteria uh, allow you to build essentially a theory that's your best estimate. Okay? And it's just a means that we use to um, solve problems. Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, there is a, a NASA consultant called uh, Ross, and he has a very a very nice paper. He wrote many, many papers on using optimal control to, um, to control uh, spacecrafts. Okay? And uh, he has a lot of experience on that, uh, including practical experience. As I told you, he was a distinguished NASA consultant. Uh, and in, in a paper of synthesis of, about his experience, he says, well, I formulate this uh, as uh, the optimization of a cost function. Now, which cost function? Uh, you should try all sorts of cost functions. And uh, then uh, perhaps you do a combination of different cost functions to build still 
other cost functions. And uh, what is the ultimate uh, decision on, on the cost function that you should use are the results that you get. Okay? So uh, don't think that uh, least squares is the beginning and the end of the story. Okay, it's just a beginning and uh, uh, choosing the correct cost to solve one problem, either in estimation or in control, is uh, a very important, is the most important part of the engineer because the optimization numerics, I mean, you, you have packages, very good packages that you can use. Now, you can think uh, about this question, why to study least squares? Uh, actually, least squares, first of all, are very simple. And they, this is important in computational terms. Uh, more than that, they are quite general. They, are, they work in many, many problems. And uh, they are robust in the sense that uh, the convergence conditions uh, allow you to converge to the optimal solution in many different possible situations in which your assumptions uh, are not valid, okay? So uh, it's quite important to have uh, least squares and also they are, in many cases, a basic building block of, uh, building block of uh, other methods. So it's quite important that this is. Okay, let me give you just, this is the picture of Gauss. He was not young Gauss here, he had some age. As you can see, he has uh, white hair. And uh, uh, here are some comments about, about the, the, the discovery of these squares. The, the situation was that uh, they had observed, the astronomers observed, that the various um, uh, radius of the orbits of the different planets in the solar system, they verify a, a very simple uh, law with integral numbers. No one knows whether there is a physical reason for that or just by chance, but uh, actually this, uh, uh, this law was, uh, was uh, verified. So, they started looking for planets uh, in, or in, in positions or for orbits for which uh, this law would, would uh, predict the existence of a planet, but the planet was not known. And uh, there was the discovery, I think, of Uranus, of planet Uranus, and it was big excitement, okay? Big excitement. And then uh, people started believing that this was true. So there was uh, an orbit that was um, uh, predicted and no, one, no planet was known at that orbit. Uh, now we know it's the uh, asteroid belt. You know that uh, pieces of rock, they form a so-called asteroid belt, probably some planet that was never built or was disintegrated. And people started working at that position without knowing that, that it was corresponding to the asteroid belt. And uh, actually, in 1801, uh, an, an Italian astronomer in, working in uh, Napoli called Piazzi, he observed a small planet called Ceres. It's a very small planet in the asteroid belt. When you say uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, uh, Mars, and so on, you, you never mention Ceres. But it's a small planet. And Piazzi observed it, but um, due to the fact that uh, this uh, small planet uh, was hidden by the sun, he had a small number of data, okay? And uh, with this data, the whole community of astronomers started trying to estimate the parameters of the orbit to predict, to make predictions about the position in which Ceres would appear after it passed it, uh, behind the sun. 
and uh, uh, Carl Gauss appeared with a prediction that was completely different from the others. Okay? And uh, to the amazement of biggest astronomers, because Gauss was virtually unknown, he was a young boy, uh, or a, a young man, if you want, uh, he, the prediction of Gauss was the correct one. Uh, Gauss was using the least squares, and uh, instead the other were just inverting, considering one point of the observations of Piazzi, and inverting the equations to get the parameters. Okay? Instead, Gauss was combining the whole available data points uh, to, according to, to the least squares. That's, that's the, it, it was perhaps one of the biggest uh, victories of combining um, experimental observations uh, with mathematical analysis to make uh, an important discovery. Okay, okay, this is one example. I'm not going to do it here, but uh, I invite you to. Uh, solve this problem and in the next class uh, if you want to prepare a couple of slides uh, you you some one of you will uh, will uh, uh, show the result uh, we have three point we have six points here but if you want you can use just the first three points okay estimating the gravity acceleration from this data okay uh, bear in mind respect this data because uh, i i was throwing stones from the top of the electricity north tower in technical and uh, many students suffered from these stones falling to their heads so this data is a precious one okay so try to solve that problem uh, let me let me now uh, go on to problems that are related to uh, to the course that we want to study at home. And this is difference equations. And we want to estimate parameters of difference equations. So our parameters are a1, a2, etc., a n, b0, b1, b n. And I will just formulate a problem and stop, and then we are going to solve this problem in, uh, in the next class. So what is the problem? We have the system to identify, and we do experiments. So you apply inputs, sequence of numbers, and you record the outputs. You have sequence of numbers, okay? Let's assume that the sampling interval is even, is constant. And from these two sequence of numbers, I want, I have an estimator that estimates from the values of y and u, the parameters a1, a2, an, b0, b1, bn. Okay? That's the problem that we have. And we are going to uh, solve this problem by uh, applying these ideas of these squares. First, I have a batch of observation points, and then I will show how to modify this batch solution to obtain a recursive solution okay before uh, going uh, i wouldn't say going home because we are at home but before stopping this session uh, do you want to make some questions or make some comments or say something no Okay, uh, solve the problem, solve this problem that I mentioned to you, and we will see each other next week. Bye, Professor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye.